vehicle the best that you possibly can. And what's unique with focusing on a perception software is when you have whatever the hardware budget is for that vehicle, sensors plus processors being the, the primary hardware, the answer of anybody who's gonna build a car is gonna be give me the best perception that you possibly can given this hardware budget. And that's not inherently true of the full system when you look at L2 or L4 because the, the budget is what determines the system and the, the way that you drive the car, whether it's a person that's <coughs> assisted by machines, whether it's a machine fully driving, drives the decisions in the whole system. So those systems don't scale as well. Uh, so we do have distinct boxes here, meaning we don't do path planning, we don't develop our own sensors, we don't develop custom silicon IP, which I'll get into later, and we also, uh, we don't build the maps ourselves. It might seem like it's similar, maps and perception, they are, uh, but in reality, maps is how do I know with very high confidence things that are static that won't change, whereas we're more focused on the dynamic objects, what's going on right now in real time that the maps would never be able to see. So what are the approaches to real-time perception? Even though this is a transitional slide, I kind of like it because it helps to uh, at least put a human digestible image to, I'm talking about AI software and things that are kind of not palatable. Uh, so this is what a perception system might look like to a human. A lot of these green boxes and sections, and like these are things that your brain does automatically when you drive uh, without you trying. And we need to teach the machine the car, how to do these things uh, so that it can make the right driving decisions that you that you make inherent. Right? So I, that is kind of what a visualized output would look from our system, but in many cases we wouldn't even necessarily have a, a front end. Right? We would just uh, we would just feed this data directly into the path planning system, and people would never even see it. But it helps to to think about it like that. So the most popular approach today, traditional computer vision, all the cameras that are used for ADAS, for automatic emergency braking, uh, some for adaptive cruise control, although that's a little bit more radar-centric still today. Uh, the bottom line is the stuff that's out there on the road today that you can buy in typically higher-end cars is, uh, it uses traditional computer vision, right? Which means uh, you used to have some really, really smart people get in a room together, you know, PhDs in computer science and mechanical engineering, and <coughs> literally code to the computer, uh, what does a car look like? Usually that's some collection of, of shapes with a little bit of histogram. So uh, that's worked great. Uh, we, we all know about the, like Mobileye has shown immense success in this space. Uh, but there are some limitations to what the systems that are out there can do today. Firstly, they're tied to a specific hardware bundle, right? So even Mobileye develops their own ASICs. They're, they're a chip company just as much as they're a software company. And uh, if, you, if you just look at what we've seen computer vision and with deep learning do, uh, deep learning has not only beaten the average human, but more importantly has improved at a rate that uh, other computer vision technologies, you know, they hit their ceiling long ago. And deep learning is surpassing what humans can do and going far beyond that. <coughs> so, a lot of the world has figured that out, and so deep learning and deep neural networks are super popular in cars today, in uh, <coughs> autonomous prototypes. Uh, but the problem is that this is what they typically require, right? It's, uh, this is a, just a University of Arizona, so I'm you know, not knocking on any specific particular uh, car company here. But this is what it looks like today, because the, the newest advancements in deep learning are coming out of universities. Uh, they're not incentivized to focus on the computer systems side of it. They are trying to beat last year's paper in accuracy by any means possible, right? They don't care if they spend four weeks training on dozens of AWS servers, and, like, and, and they don't care if they run in real time, right? They just need to publish a report with the results that showed they were better than, than last year's paper. And uh, there's not a lot of expertise in terms of actually uh, customizing those models and building them up from scratch so that you can reach the level of understanding that enables you to uh, build them for an efficient computer system. The, pro the way you solve the problem today is, well, let's just throw another GPU at it 
<coughs> and that'll let us do the type of computation that we need to, to reach peak accuracies. So where DeepScale comes in and changes that paradigm, I won't go into painful detail on this slide because these are publicly available papers that were published out of uh, DeepScale, some of them with UC Berkeley too. Uh, but basically we, we do exactly what I said most of the world is, has not really focused on yet. Uh, where if that curve goes maximize accuracy for, for as long as you can and most of the world is just still riding that up with compute and higher and higher accuracy, we are the ones that are digging into the various dimensions of deep learning from the frameworks to the actual algorithms and, and everything in between so that we can still keep those state-of-the-art accuracies but do it on orders of magnitude less computing because when you really dig into into the weeds of what the software is doing <coughs> uh, you can you can just create efficiencies that uh, won't be solved by just saying let's wait for the next chipset which fun fact one of my investors is telling me that he's doing research, a research report that he plans to publish on how software and algorithm efficiency can actually outpace Moore's law. So I'll let you know once I see that. So what does that all mean, right? Like why, why can't everybody just go pick up deep neural nets and you know, make them tiny and everybody goes home happy? Because look how the, the stack is so simple, right? Like there's, that's it. It's just, you, you need your data. You build models, you run that on some infrastructure, and then you apply it to some application, whether that be speech recognition, if you're focused on cell phones, or like we are, you know, doing driving related. Uh, and the reality is, and I've made this slide purposely busy, it's like a combination of four different slides, is that each one of these blocks breaks out into multiple elements. And they're in separate boxes right now, uh, because the way that the world is approaching these problems right now is that they're typically siloed off, right? Whether it's in academia or whether it's at some huge company where you have your AI infrastructure team and you have your AI models team, these, these heads aren't talking in, 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 a, in a way that shortens the feedback loop enough. So what you get is you get a newly developed model that gets optimized for the infrastructure that was available when they started building the model and then when the model's ready, the infrastructure team comes out and says, well, we updated the infrastructure. Like, we can run more efficient code now. And they say, well, we, we wrote it for the last version, right? And you have this really long iteration cycle. So what we're doing at DeepScale is really simple still, right? Like, just moving, moving the words in the blocks. But we're, we're trying to break down those silos, right? So we, we don't have a dedicated team. We're, we're more integrated where... Yeah, we might have infrastructure experts, we might have high performance computing experts, etc. But they're working <coughs> in cohesion with, uh, with what, their, you know, what their colleagues are doing. So if somebody says, you know, I thought of this great new operator that's not, it's not available in QDNN, but I, I really think that it could speed up some task that I'm doing, they go and talk to our, our framework team and say like, hey, can we can we write the vectorized code so that I can use this type of math, which is not available in an NVIDIA library? And is that, and that all ties back to, well, yeah, we also have the infrastructure in place to run that, and that's gonna speed up the whole thing for the application. And we've been able to, to iterate and build models and train <coughs> models much faster, kind of at the, the Pareto optimal curve of, of what they can do, instead of being stuck, like a lot of time, figuring out, well, why didn't I get the type of return that I thought I would? Well, I, I was stuck using some of yesterday's puzzle pieces. And what that has created is, like, this is how we think of our engineers, right? Like, they do all of these things, which this is a shameless plug to, like, if you're a deep learning engineer, like, come work with us, we'll make you even better at being a deep learning engineer. We're a great environment for it. Uh, but, but we think that's, that's a real differentiator, and it's a, it's a cultural difference from how we see a lot of these companies, uh, a lot of the big companies, uh, trying to, to bring new new deep learning tech to the industry. So uh, what that means for what we're actually building, and then I'll show a little short demo video that uh, is a little, a little raw. It's just data pulled off of our data car that's uh, been driving around lately. But this, that means this is what we're doing today, right? So I mentioned, you know, I, I think our, our company thinks it's a little too risky as a startup that 
uh, doesn't want to tell its investors from day one that it's going to take hundreds of millions of dollars worth of investment before you make any money, uh, that you need to find a way to make money faster, uh, especially in automotive, which <coughs> is inherently a slow moving market. So right now we, we are working on more ADAS types of systems, so automatic emergency braking, the type of stuff that NCAP 2020 is geared towards. There are tons of improvements to make there. You can save so many lives by just having a better ADAS, a better driver assistance system. You don't need cars driving themselves from point A to point B to bring tons of value to society. Uh, in the meantime, we also do more advanced engagements. So the demo I'll show shows a little bit of, of both of those. Uh, and that's where we start pulling in radar, pulling in LIDAR, uh, because we know those, well, radar's cost is, has already been down for a long time, but LIDAR costs will come down, adoption will increase, and we'll only have more and more opportunity to improve the accuracies of, and the, the coverage of these systems. And then that, we believe, is gonna, is gonna let us extend into full autonomy, right, L4. Um, I, I'm, at this point, not, I think I'm not too much of a, a black sheep when I say that I, I'm a skeptic of the, you know, the people who run around saying that we'll have cars driving themselves all over San Francisco in, in 2020. I don't think it's gonna be a step function like many enthusiasts have led the world to believe. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm hoping to be proven wrong because that would be exciting. But I, I do think uh, incrementally iterating towards you know, good enough, or, you know, approaching perfect fully autonomous systems is what it's gonna take. And that's how, that's how we're positioning, uh, you know, using deep learning in these types of systems to get there. So now to show a little bit of what that actually means and a little bit of what sensor fusion as we know it might look like. Let me show this little video demo. Might be hard to see in the back. Uh, but what we're showing here is this is data that was collected in San Francisco uh, with, our, with our data collection vehicle. The map is here just for we're not using it in any way in the sensor fusion, it's just there to show where the car is. But again, that's one of those, uh, could I leverage this data in the future, which is why we collect the data, even though we're not using it for any sort of training right now. Uh, but what we are doing is we have the two front-facing cameras, which are set up in kind of a pseudo stereo setup, but we don't do any of the traditional stereo matching algorithms, we just let deep neural nets figure everything out. We here have the four beam Ibeo Scala LiDAR. So this is a LiDAR that we're led to believe is like a sub $500 LiDAR. It's what's on the Audi A8s in production already in what they call their L3 system, although it's a little limited on speed. And then in the bottom left corner, this is the <coughs> Velodyne 32 beam LiDAR. And down here, this is where we're actually doing some sensor fusion, right? So. Again, sensor fusion means different things to different people. Uh, and there's also a spectrum of what you mean when you say sensor fusion, whether you do it at the object level, whether you do it down at what people say is the raw level or the early sensor fusion. And uh, we, I think, have somewhat invented a new form of sensor fusion where we actually use other sen sen certain sensor modalities to emulate other sensor modalities. And that's what we're seeing here. So we're actually taking the camera inputs and the, the low resolution, the Scala input. So this is like less than $1,000 worth of sensor hardware. And we are producing a point cloud that would be produced by like a $75,000 LiDAR. Uh, the, the 32 beam Velodyne is just here for comparison, uh, just so that you can see the two point clouds measure up against each other. And let me just say, we're, this is not some spiel to like replace LiDAR completely with camera. That is not what we're getting after here. Uh, lasers are going to be more accurate than a camera, okay? Uh, but this does have implications in terms of the potential for redundancy if a LiDAR goes out. Uh, the ability to activate uh, convenience features in lower end vehicles, so if you saw the a second step in our roadmap was bringing 
features down market. So for instance, being able to get a 3D point cloud, which we can actually get from just a single camera too with relatively high accuracy, being able to do that in a low-end vehicle that only has the budget for a single camera, but can now get a 3D representation of its environment that in low speeds is accurate enough that the car can park itself or can pull itself out of the driveway is something that I think is, is a really nice feature to bring to you know, $15,000 cars that's currently reserved for $70,000, $80,000 cars. Um, so let's, let's run this. Uh, the red boxes are uh, just vehicle detections that we're doing. Uh, this is all running in real time. Uh, you can see, again, when I compare it against to what I say, the traditional computer vision, uh, you typically would not see traditional computer vision picking out the various angles of these cars, certainly not the ones that we actually pick out from just seeing the top half over the center divide. Uh, that totally breaks traditional computer vision. Not that you necessarily need that in the driving application, but it shows you what type of capability we have with a you know, low intersection over union and the object detector still being able to pick it out. <coughs> and since cameras, one advantage that they do have over LiDAR is that they will, for the foreseeable future, uh, have higher resolution, means that uh, you can see there are actually some cars that because of the, you know, the, the LiDAR beams disperse as the, the distance increases, you can actually see that our camera-based point cloud uh, picks up blobs of cars, uh, in many cases, better than, than the LiDAR. Uh, ben, could you just tell us once more what each of those is? Good. Yeah, yeah. So, Sorry. so again, the, the bottom left is a Velodyne 32 beam LiDAR. So this is, I mean, it's on the top of our car, spinning. We're not doing anything special with the data. All we've done is uh, cropped the field of view so that it's similar to the one that we're showing with the cameras. And then this is an output from our neural network that takes as an input these two cameras and the low resolution LiDAR. And essentially, up samples is kind of a misnomer, but it produces a high resolution point cloud from, from the cameras. And what is that one, middle, middle left? Middle left is the low resolution LiDAR. So it's hard to see. Uh, there are only four beams here, and it also has a, a lower, sorry, rather a higher angular resolution. No, lower angular res resolution than the, the Velodyne. We're using two cameras. We're using two cameras. Why is that? Why, why uh, we, as we stack the, uh, as we contribute more sensors into the neural net, we can actually increase accuracy. Uh, so that's also uh, something that's you know, just inherently different from your old stereo matching. Uh, like stereo matching works by drawing triangles. If you add a third camera, your triangle doesn't get any better. You kind of, if anything, you would just confuse the system because you have more variables. When you let a neural net learn contributions from sensors, adding sensors can actually have an, a, an additive effect for a longer amount of time. So we can produce the same resolution of point cloud from just a single camera. Adding a second camera, uh, improves the accuracy by a few percentage points. And adding <coughs> the, the low resolution LiDAR increases that accuracy a bit further. Of course, accuracy kind of has an asterisk on it, right? Because is point by point accuracy of a point cloud really that important for the application of driving? My argument is no. Uh, you don't need to know that there are a million points on the screen and that all of them are within, you know, in the field of view and that all of them are within 1% relative error on distance. What you need to know is that the objects that are important in the field that you could crash into or what you need to understand is detected with a, a very high level of accuracy. So what we actually use the low resolution LiDAR for is not to increase the accuracy of the point cloud substantially. We use it to dial in the accuracy of the detected objects. Right, and that's where you get a little bit more, that's like step one of the promise that sensor fusion is supposed to have, which is how can I take the strengths of some sensors and combine those with the strengths of other sensors so that my entire system has a better understanding. Right, so camera, really good at semantic understanding of the scene, can really find very well where the cars are, but is really bad at predicting distance to them. 
but if you can fuse it with the LiDAR properly, even if it's a cheaper LiDAR, you can get really accurate distance to very high confidence detected objects. Yeah. Can you vary the field of view of the camera? Yeah, so that's a, that's a non-trivial problem that we have been working yeah. on. It's, let's say, the... Speed of the car, actually, that will determine... What, what was what the question? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. You can repeat the question. For the yeah, picture. so b basically, can you vary the field of view of the camera, right? So uh, your traditional computer vision systems, again, since they're based on rigid algorithms, typically break pretty fast if you try to move them. You have to mount them kind of in more or less the same spot. Uh, we... The, the learned systems do a little bit better than that. We have some leeway that we can move it and we still get useful results, which then allows us to retrain in that setup and get up and running much faster. We don't have to go like write everything from scratch, but I don't want to over trivialize that. That's like one of the things that every OEM told, tells us, like if you had the, the magic way to let me move cameras and not have to rebuild my whole system and go spend hundreds or thousands of hours retraining, like that's kind of a holy grail of, of portability right now, and it, it's not trivial. Are you doing this without any GPU help? The drawing so, so we we are running this on GPUs. We pro in our vehicle we prototype on an NVIDIA desktop GPU because it's easy for us. We can build tons and tons of features. We don't have to worry about efficiency. This we got running on an NVIDIA PX2, uh, and. Soon, soon to be released, we're, uh, we'll announce our reference design that is geared towards <coughs> smaller non-GPU types of SOCs. Uh, so we have, I mentioned, you know, we really get into the weeds on like, frameworks, particularly, particularly we're building a deployment framework uh, that we're, we're in the process of patenting that lets us run, uh, run neural nets on like, the ARM cores and accelerators from the kind of household names of automotive SOC suppliers and, and their accelerators. So, yeah. so where is the training done independently and has been done before? And this is just the inference. This is just just inference here. We we have a pretty separate workflow for training and inference, and that's that's what we plan to do for our production deployments too. Uh, training happens either from our our vehicle, uh, customer data, or simulation data are the three primary ways. But then we deploy basically an embedded binary in the vehicle and just let it run inference based on the sensor. Inputs. So I'm new to the world of auto, but I'm into deep learning. But mm -hmm. uh, so, so the training requires that the, the path that you are going to be taking later, right? I mean, you, you would have had the, to the train path? onto the on the path the vehicle would go. No, no, no. Oh, no. Well, that the whole point is we are we want to generalize to wherever, right? I mean, we which. May, again, that's maybe where we differentiate ourselves from what a mapping system is. A mapping system has to have mapped the area that it's going to, to serve to the vehicle, right? We're picking up the dynamic objects in the scene. So object and detection and... Object detection, I mean, lanes, you don't have to know where the lanes are to run into them and, and pick them up in real time. Uh, signs, all of these things are, you know, what mostly convolutional neural networks are used for today. Uh, but. Yeah, we, I mean, these, these cars have driven, we do most of our driving in Mountain View because that's where the office is, but they've driven everywhere, you know, Oregon to Southern California. We've gotten data sent to us from customers in Europe where we just don't even retrain. We just throw in driving data so from Germany and run inference on accidents I hear about on Uber. <laughs> yeah. Is it uh, different? It's uh, what do you what do you mean different? <laughs> I, mean, like, I, I, I guess uh, those are also autonomous driving vehicles, right? Sure. Are they all not using the deep learning technology that you have? Uh, I, I mean, I can't comment too much because I don't know what's going on inside. But I mean, the there was the the report released on what happened with the the Uber crash. It was just released a couple of days ago, and the the key takeaway was uh, the system picked up that there was an object picked up, then it said, while it was far away, that it was an unknown object. Then it said, wait, I think it's a car, but I'm not sure. And then when it got close enough, they said, the, the system actually said, no, this is a, a bike pedestrian. Uh, the problem was that the car did not react to that. I can't comment on why, but what we're focusing on is saying in very high confidence, yes, that was a bike. Yes, that bike is coming into your lane. And we would serve the data to the pathfinding system that says, here are 
here's all the data and all the metadata that you need about everything going on around you based on how you've taught your car how to drive. Again, taught might be a misnomer because some of this might be hard coded. Uh, they would have to make a decision to hit the bricks. Right? So uh, we're just trying to get the richest information possible about the scene around the car. Yeah. Well, I have several questions actually. So uh, do you degress the poles of the car? Uh, we are working on that right now. Yeah. Uh, so I, yeah. Because this is just for like, this is a flat box here is fine, but then it's like Correct. intersection. It's, yeah. So this, yeah, this summer, I mentioned that reference design that will, that reference design will include pose oh. estimation. So. And you, you mentioned you have, uh, you also have just a pure stereo, uh, uh, basically point clouds and even more. We have a single camera. Yeah. Yeah, and you have more of that. Yep. But we don't see it here, right? Uh, we don't see it here. Yeah. Uh, to the human eye, the point cloud would look similar, yeah, and the yeah. object detections obviously are unaffected since that's still done just on the camera. Is it reliably working like for occluded objects? <clears throat> for what objects? One of that, so is it reliably working for like occluded objects? Uh, it depends what you define as, as reliably working. I mean, it, it estimates the depth most accurately mm -hmm. for the first object in the field of view. Right. right? Yeah. The, that's where having additional sensors, seeing more angles of occluded objects helps you guess the secondary, the, the tertiary. Uh, but you know, the, like the point cloud looks more or less the same. You, you, the human eye wouldn't see, it's the, the metrics that, that notice that it's less accurate. And uh, what's the frequency of your spins and uh, camera? How, how, like, how many frames per second do you do together in that fusion? Yeah, uh, so, yeah, there are, that's actually a pretty convoluted question because it can be somewhat limited by the, the LiDAR that you use if it's point cloud. But I mean, uh, when you go fully camera based, like if let's, it's easy to talk about if we just talk about the cameras, uh, then you know, we're, we're basically just limited by the compute. We've, we've run things on pretty small processors at 20 plus FPS. If you give us, you know, on, on our, NVIDIA GPU, you know, on our Titan 1080, like we can we can run this type of stuff at like you know, 100 FPS, stuff that you wouldn't need to run in an actual car. Yeah. May I ask, but probably you won't tell. Uh, how big is your network? Like, uh, like if you compare with ResNet, like is it something on the order like ResNet 18 or like ResNet 100? I mean, how how big is that? Smaller. It's smaller than ResNet smaller 18. Than 18. Ah, yeah. it's very small. Okay. Yep. What was the uh, low resolution fiber you use back then? Uh, that's the Ibeo uh, Scala, which is short for scanning laser. So it's produced by Valio. I think you could look at it. I mean, it's a public video. <coughs> uh, yeah, Audi has it on their cars already. What is the cost of each camera? Like a few the, dollars? Or uh, these, are, these are stand, I mean, these are prototyping cameras, so maybe they're not the most representative, but the Main takeaway is they're, they're three megapixel cameras, and we actually, for the sake of the throughput in our models, and because we're, we've been focusing on that like 80 meter to 100 meter range, we actually downsample them to like half a megapixel. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're not using some crazy 4K camera here. Right. So, yeah. so why don't you use the, the maps basically, because it can let you eliminate the static objects very easily. Mm -hmm. Won't it make it more accurate with less computation? Time and resources. <laughs> well, it's we'd like to get there. We're working on some projects where we're interfacing with mapping companies and figuring out how to integrate the two things because yeah, there there could be redundancies where you could save on compute resources, uh, but we just haven't reached it. But then to be able to track the location of the vehicle, yeah, you you would have to do self localization. Yeah, uh, and that's an open question too, right? Uh, should the perception system do self localization? Should the mapping know. system? Should both? And then they <laughs> measure and see okay. who's right, right? So, so those are all still getting figured out. But there's, yeah, there there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. How long the model uh, yeah, that's again, that's another one of those convoluted questions. So we, we train our models typically overnight. It's a combination of one, we have folks with distributed training, like, like uh, if you're familiar with Fire Cafe, like that came out of our team. Um, so one, we know how to do distributed training. Two, we make small models with less parameters. And when you combine those two things, you get really, really fast training. Uh, we're also not training on like 
massive, massive data sets right now. We're not training each model on you know, thousands and thousands of hours uh, because we just, you know, we're iteratively building forward. So long story short, we, most of our models are training overnight at this point, maybe over the weekend for like something new that we're throwing a, a ton of data out that we haven't optimized the, the architecture of the model. So what's the size of the data set overall? Um, we, we have, oh, I actually don't know off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, some thousands of hours of data oh. recorded around here. Yeah. And again, we augment that with data that we get from our customers. They're bigger companies. They tend to have even more data than we do. And simulation is obviously that, you know, that's the huge volume play. But we've only dabbled in simulation. It hasn't been a, a core piece of our training set yet. And can you elaborate on the math models for the fusion part? How do you fuse from various sensors? Um, I can't elaborate on that. One, I'm not the one who built it. Two, particularly for creating point clouds from camera, we have a patent pending on it. So. That's exactly <laughs> Yeah. So the, da the data set and the model you, you, uh, you guys will public somewhere or just no? Yeah, so I think ultimately a lot of this, I mean, we come from an academic background, I think a lot of these things will publish piecemeal mm -hmm. here and there. Um, and then it'll, that'll somehow balance with the proprietary stuff that we do that we sell. To, to so especially this model, it's, uh, it's not yet out there? Right? It's not out there. <coughs> yeah. Your business model is built around sensor fusion, where you take a lot of low-end sensor, combining them to get the same quality as a high-end sensor. Right? Um, for the more advanced, like for more L4 types of systems where you have lots of sensors, I would say uh, yes, that's that's one of the angles. But more short-term, our model would be like licensing software into a smart camera that a tier one could pick up and then. You know, maybe like the, right now the, the tier one world basically builds what Mobileye tells them to build. Right? Uh, we're building a software that we think will, will open up that box a little bit. Uh, you have Bosch and Conti trying to build uh, those types of smart cameras too. And they, you know, by, by reports across the industry, haven't, haven't cracked the, the Mobileye nut all that well yet because uh, folks haven't figured out how to fit deep learning into the type of cost budget that a smart camera needs. And we think we have the software that will let the hardware budget still compete with the, the price point for smart cameras. Because one of the big challenges in this field is that there's a big debate over sensor fusion is that mm -hmm. each sensor has different failure mode. Right. And they provide redundancy because of the rep replication. But by using minimal to each, don't you have a risk of not having that redundancy? So we actually, we don't throw that information away, right? So if you look at like one of our multi-sensor models, if one of the sensors breaks, uh, we can actually detect that the sensor broke by the degradation of the output, right? So we actually, if anything, have ways to improve the redundancy because if you're working in a system where each sensor has its own vertical stack, uh, if your you know your best sensor breaks or a sensor that's responsible for something breaks, uh, that function is totally done. Whereas we have a more holistic contribution to these functions, and we can say you know we might be able to to better respond to, oh hey the the lidar went down, but we can still generate a point cloud from the cameras, which gives us enough confidence to navigate off the road instead of like mayday mayday red alert slam on all the brakes. Yeah, I guess the challenge is. Not necessarily failure, but mm -hmm. sensor for different weakness, right? Sure. The camera low light versus rain lidar. Yep. So, so that's again, that's something that is not a solved problem by any means, but by by getting into the the deeper levels of, of fusion, that's something that we hope to actually improve and, and add to, right? Because when you have them all contributing to a model uh, that y you'd be able to to learn when you're getting bad data from a camera, right? So at night, you start discounting the cameras a little. Whereas, again, in that, that vertically integrated approach, uh, you might not necessarily know. You're just gonna be getting like, really bad votes from a camera, and that bad vote is just gonna throw off your good votes from the radar. Okay. Yeah. 
actually it's okay. kind of related to that one that uh, if you have actually camera, it doesn't have to be a failure because different cameras may have different characteristics under low light, mm -hmm. partial degradation of the sensors and things like that. Yeah. How would you know that? Because you've learned on probably a good camera, right? Yeah, so we train across multiple cameras so that we can generalize to different types of extrinsic and intrinsic variables better. Uh, there's a whole other nut to crack there of yeah. like, should you train on, is it RGB, is it RCCB, should you go earlier, should you train on raw images? I actually just saw a really interesting paper on uh, tra basically training, training a neural network to take dark images and be able to like, do a much better correction yeah. than like debayering wood or anything like that, right? So, so that's like a whole other design space to, to explore. Uh, but in the short term, we're more dealing with uh, automotive cameras that have you know, a, a great HDR that do well at night. How do you make the best of okay. the information those cameras so It's an HDR image, basically. You do have uh, a dynamic image. Uh, uh, the stuff that's being put into automotive stuff moving forward is, yeah, has, has a good dynamic image. And only two megapixel images for HDR images? Uh, right now, I think two megapixel, from what I'm hearing, talking to OEMs and tier ones, is like kind of, is what's popular going into like 2020 types of vehicles. Um, so, you know, there's they're pretty okay. low end actually. Uh, they're still cost driven. Right? <laughs> yeah. Actually, the question actually uh, similar to to this whole question. I mean, uh, your training tool actually is a, I mean is need to be customized to different uh, hardware. Uh, do you mean sensor hardware? Yeah. 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 So we, there's, again, there's some amount of transferability that will occur. Uh, but for sure, a, a big part of what we're doing and what we think will ultimately differentiate us is building a, a database that is trained across lots and lots of sensors. And then not only do you perform better on the sensors that you've trained on, you also are highly likely to generalize to new sensors better because your system has seen something like it before. Or, or actually have a translator, just a second. Uh, translator between the raw images into a standardized format, so it is kind of sensor independent. Then. Yep, so that, that's part of the thinking with the, the point cloud, right? It's, and, and that's okay. something that we do utilize in our, our deployment framework too, is essentially creating like intermediation layers. Yes. So we do that with code already for deploying onto different you know, microarchitectures, different processor microarchitectures, where we abstract the code into like vectorized C++ as opposed to some like QDNN code or, or Core ML or something like that. Um, and the same concept applies here, right? If you can create a point cloud that always looks like point cloud regardless of which sensor it comes from, and you can use that to drive your inferences and your, your insights, uh, then you've created some this intermediate layer that can abstract away the nuances of different sensors. So actually, as this gentleman said, actually if the same product uh, at a different environment, will that take impact on your training? Like different driving environment, different geography? Yeah, their geography also, H, like HDR, different light, dark yeah. light. Uh, yeah, so control. it definitely still matters. Like I want to make sure I'm not <laughs> over-trivializing it, right? But, that's typically, like, once you prove out that the system works very, very well in a single geography, and then you go talk to an OEM or a tier one, and they say, well, we're gonna go sell these cars all over the world, uh, then typically there's a concerted effort, which, again, since these are bigger companies, like the OEMs are helping, they, they take the responsibility on themselves, they go out and then collect training data in like 50 different countries or something crazy like that, right? And then all that's gonna do is, is make your model, once you train it on that new data, it's, it's basically just gonna get better, right? So uh, it's it's kind of one of those things that it's not a problem we have to solve up front uh, because we're gonna solve it later in the development. It's part of why the automotive cycle is still as long as it is. Uh, about your training data, you say it's, uh, you use the real data, there is no simulated data used for training? Uh, right now we've been using almost primarily, almost completely real data. Okay. Uh, we've used some sims for a few special features that we built, uh, but yeah, I think we're also waiting on, there's a lot of companies trying to build better sim tools right now and stuff, so I think maybe it's a little premature to be fully reliant on sims right now. But I think there's there could be some interesting problems there. One question about yep. commercialization. Sure. You touched on Bosch and Continental, 
and they're struggling a bit. But here in the valley, there's, I don't know, say 10, 15 companies making LiDAR and other type systems that are startups um, varying from a garage to something a bit better than that. Um, if you're an automotive OEM, then you might trust Bosch and Continental inherently just because of your you're absolutely long standing right. <laughs> So from your point of view, I mean, how do you guys play into all that? I mean, you could on one hand license to a well-known tier one. You could license, I guess, perhaps to the OEM and say, we'll help you cobble together disparate pieces and give it a better layer of trust. And where do you see yourself longer term yeah. into the ecosystem? Great question. So so firstly, yeah, Conti and Bosch are definitely more trusted than any company in the Valley. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I wasn't uh, bringing them up in terms of companies that aren't doing well. I mean, they're two of the biggest tier ones there are out there. But specifically, their smart camera modules are not taking a chunk out of Mobileye as much as they would have hoped. Uh, but where we fit into that is that we would want to provide them with the software that lets them compete on the technical level with what Mobileye has you know, claimed incumbency with, and then let them uh, leverage their strengths, which are not inherently in deep learning. They're in building automotive systems and going and testing them and selling them to OEMs, and then they could go have success with those camera models as us a supplier, as us as a supplier into that camera module. And we also have direct to OEM engagements, but uh, ADAS, I think with our strategic decision to focus on ADAS in the short term, that's a relatively well-defined uh, you know, requirement set, and so, I expect that in the short term we'll be engaging more in our mass production efforts with tier ones. Uh, but with that said, some of our more AR and D type of stuff that we're doing that's more geared towards L4 is direct to OEM engagement. Yep. So is your deep learning TensorFlow, PNTK, PyTorch, <coughs> and, or some other smaller? So for training, we use we've used kind of all of those at one point or another, but for training we use our, our own version of, our own spin-off of MXNet, actually. And for deployment is where <coughs> we are building our own framework, since we don't think any of those are that great for embedded efficient deployments. So, and then, uh, what do you think of that, that company in Pasadena that's kind of just trains LiDAR 99%? The one that GM bought, I forget. Oh. Uh, yeah, that, is that Princeton? Uh, Prin Strobe. Princeton? Strobe? Oh, Princeton was fourth, right? Yeah. He, that's the LiDAR guy, he knows. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, Jen, I'm excited, right? Like, for us, that's why... The LiDAR on the chip. Right, can, right. Which can embed in, in your windscreen. Which, I mean, we, we're excited at all this, right? I, that's why we've made it very clear we're, we're a software supplier, right? We, the more great sensors we have, the more great processors we have to work with, like all that does is open up optionality for the industry to choose the best solutions out there. And if anything, we see ourselves as the horizontal layer that will let car manufacturers or fleet managers or whoever it is uh, have a wider selection of what to, what to build from so that they can continue to improve and find their own ways to differentiate. So I mean, I'm, I'm super excited for all the so new sensors. So and then you build your model with a lot of data, in, and then you, you make a light version and put it in the X for the car? Uh, effectively, yeah. I, I think that's generally right. I want to be careful with light, because we, we do, you know, we want to make sure that it doesn't sound like we're you know, sacrificing the reliability or accuracy that's required for automotive. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a lot of magic that can go into taking from something that runs on some massive GPU and getting it to run on the edge without having to make sacrifices. Massive GPU, massive amount of data. Yep. So, um, you're saying that your algorithm allows some of the computation to take place at edge, that? So people define edge as different things in the car, right? Okay, I, just, camera, I just mean embedded mind. in the vehicle, right? So that could be a true edge ECU, like a chip that's embedded in the camera. It could be a central computer in the car that talks to other ECUs. I frankly don't care that much. It doesn't even look that different to our software, because if you look at a neural net, you look at the layers, like uh, let's say I have 100 layers, I don't really care if they all sit on a central computer or if we have 20 layers sitting on some ECU and the output from those goes to our other 80 layers, like that's all kind of the same thing. So, for so what is it written in? Like, I mean, when you're saying you can embed it into a host CPU, mm -hmm. 
what is this written in the the deployment part the inferencing part is, no, what code is written, you mean? Yeah, it, it must be written in a low level yeah, so, we, so that's so that's environment, right? Real well, so, operating system environment. Yeah, so so RTOS again that like we're trying to remain agnostic to like what the OS and like middleware is going to be too. But, you know, a lot of people are using ROS right now more for prototyping because it has some shortcomings in terms of its its real-time determinism and all that. Uh, but yeah, in the end of the day, like whatever the OEMs and tier ones tell us is going to be running in the car, like we have a binary and we wrap it in whatever APIs it needs to be wrapped in so that it can be called. And you basically feed sensor data in, you get some data structure out of it, and that data structure is all the information that the car needs to make its decisions. So besides quantization and downsampling, what else do you guys do to... So it? yeah, people, people tend to... Like people think when it comes down to making smaller models that it's like quantization and pruning. That's like all you can do, right? The reality is that it's like a practically infinite design space to explore, right? There's writing completely new operations, right? Like right now, everybody uses convolutions because somebody figured out a while ago that convolutions are like a really good math for being able to see objects in the field, but like your the entire calculus textbook that we all used in high school is like fair game for uh, for making new operators for it, right mm -hmm. so there's the actual algorithms like actual different mathematical operations that can be explored there are architectures of how many layers what's the right filter size with it, right like there there are so many of these moving parts yes. that uh, then quantization and pruning like might happen at the end right, right? but it's right. it's over oversimplifies the problem Yep. Uh, so you commented on sort of central edge and edge edge. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely a big difference in terms of the processing envelope there. Uh, sure. And it's probably more of memory constraint around coefficients than it is around actual gigaops and so on. Agreed. Is, is that is that something that you're doing? You're doing some sort of compression around uh, coefficients, and I mean the edge. I mean it might be limited to like two, three megabytes of on-chip memory. For right. Edge so that that actually is critical. I'm glad you brought that up because memory is one of the often overlooked uh, elements of efficient computing. And the reality is if you really want to operate at the best possible efficiency, you have to stay with on-chip memory. Right? Because even if, you're, even if you're making calls to uh, some, you know, some little uh, secondary memory, like the, it, it's an order of magnitude growth in like joules per byte. There, right? So, uh, the short answer is yes, we take all of that into account. Um, and, and I agree with you. I, I totally like, oversimplified in my response. It's kind of tough if you have a lot of classes, kind of cram that down. Yeah, so, so that's, that's actually like, it, and, and each case is different, right? Like each, we, we looked into a chip recently where we looked at it and we said, hey, uh, we got asked by a tier one, can, we, wanna, we wanna do a smart camera with this chip, can you do it? We looked at it and said, yeah, from a, from a you know, flops, a peak flops perspective, like, yeah, we think we can meet the frames per second with the resolution you're asking for. And then we went and looked at it and dug deeper and it turned out like with the pipelining of the chip of how you would split up the work, it creates like some non-recoverable latency in the beginning. And like, so all of these little nuances, that's what happens at the end of the day when you say, hey, I have a model that's super efficient. I think it's ready for deployment. Then you have to dig into the nitty gritty of the, the hardware platform and figure out if it can do it. Yep. So can you talk a little about how you guys think about 26262 two, and and once you either locked in on a particular training set or locked in on a particular sensor array, are you then locked in? And you have to change that every time an automaker wants to go with a, a different sensor array or a different training set? Would yeah, you know? that is a... It's a question that I don't have a perfect answer to today. Um, it's, I, I think the, the 26262 spec as written is probably not sufficient to take us into full autonomous driving. Like we, we as an industry are gonna need to, to work on figuring that out uh, for, uh, I mean, but then if you look back, like there are machine learning implementations on the road already. 
how deep learning and the fact that it's trained on various sensors is inherently different from that. Again, I don't have the answer to yet. That's why that's why we're hiring a, a head of safety in QA, right? Because I'm a business guy. <laughs> um, but no, it's it's a but it's a it's a topic that comes up with almost every OEM and almost every tier one that we talk to. And uh, the reality is that uh, you can do you can do the best things that you can, right? You can classify your system as its own module, and you can do your whole you know uh, your F meta break down and say, well, what happens if this goes wrong in my system? And then you serve that to whoever's downstream and say, okay, now figure out what this would do to your module. And you get this cascading effect of ASOL guarantees in the system. Uh, but that's about the best we can do with how the spec's written today. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna stop them here. We'll have one last question and then I know Ben can talk all night. <laughs> so, so GM is planning to do a level five autonomous car in Chevy Bolt with no steering wheel, no pedal. They're going to start selling it production wise to fleet next year. So, how are they doing this? Um, what do you know about the. the I, I don't know any more than you do, but like I said, I'm, I'm a skeptic. <laughs> uh, when, when they hit the, the showroom floors and are available for purchase, then I will believe it. <laughs> you buy one. <laughs> <laughs> you buy one. Yeah, good question. Um, I don't buy first gen iPhones. So. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. I mean, everybody in Tesla is getting roasted. You know, the thing accelerates at the crash time, and it gets into a deadly fire. It's like, yeah. Know. All right. Thank you, Ben. Yeah.